and welcome to our 29th episode of Two Tankers and a Cat. We're your host, I'm Charlie. And this is Russell. We have uh, a great show. Um, we are going to be talking about the T-38 amphibious scout tank that was used in the Winter War against the Soviets in the Finland, and also in World War II. Uh, the second uh, point that we're going to use is or talk about is the assault crossing of the, how do you say that? The Dnep, Dnepr? The Dnepr River. I don't know, but I'm sure we're going to get corrected on it no matter. You know what? Uh, our good friend Craig Moore will send us and say. Yes, he will. Charlie is killing it yes. again. It's Dnep, D, D-N-I-E-P-E-R. Yes. River in 1943. And. I got, uh, right now, I know there's just people listening going, oh, God, these guys are so bad. <laughs> Send us back to language school. Oh, God. Um, but talking about Craig Moore, what a great guy. If you yeah. haven't read some of Craig's stuff, you need to read. Uh, he's also a big, and uh, it's tank- encyclopedia.com. Yes, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and uh, he's a, a writer over there, and he just does so much tremendous work. But he he always corrects us in the nicest way. You know, yeah. the British people are just just wonderful. But he he says um, when you're talking about British, uh, you know, or UK Army, you're saying UK. You should say the British forces and the Commonwealth forces. So we will try to, and I'm glad he did point that out because I it kind of always in the back of my mind. I knew that I needed to kind of brush up on that and and see what the correct term was because I I did not know. Uh, you know, we've been getting so many messages through Facebook and, and Gmail and stuff like that. Any way you want to contact us is yes, great. Yes, but there are people sitting there with notebook pads going, no, no. He said that wrong. That's incorrect. And we want to hear you. We yeah. want to hear about it. We do. But to see where we started from and where we are now has been such an improvement. And it's because of people like Ed, uh, Craig Moore. Uh, oh, my gosh. There's so many. There's others. so many. There's I so mean, many. we're going to leave so many names out if we start rattling names off, to be honest with you. But it's, uh, but it, it's incredible, it, the, the people that's. But helped us out. But Craig also said, listen, do you know why we call a tank a tank? And I'm like, yeah, because <laughs> it's metal. And he, no. No. Nope. <laughs> when they were doing the experiments and shipping tanks, they used, they knew they wanted to cover that up and use some type of code. So they were thinking a agricultural tank that yeah. held water. A water tank, yeah. So when, when they would hear radio traffic, uh, they would say, oh, it's a tank. Yeah. You know, the, they would look up the term tank in the, in the Oxford English Dictionary. And they were It was like, defined as agricultural. Agricultural or something that holds water. So they're saying, okay, we're sending 16 tanks to this front. They're like, oh, well, it's yeah. just for water. Sure, or, water tanks. And yeah. then all of a sudden, these metal monsters come uh, smashing through, and they're like. With a big old gun on the front. Yeah. yeah. They're yeah. like, hey, where, where, where did this come from? <laughs> they didn't do any radio traffic on that. So that is the term uh, that where we get tank. Yeah. That's so, where it all started right there. So if you didn't know that, bonus there. Heck yeah. Thank you, Craig Moore. Yeah. And Craig, keep the comments and and corrections coming. I mean, it does help us out quite a bit. You've helped our show so oh, much. Wow. I mean, everybody has. Yeah. And we have we're getting so much support. Who was the guy on YouTube that you wanted to talk about too? Yeah, a uh, shout out to Rold Tamson. I believe that's how it's pronounced. If not, he'll let us know. Uh, he had a comment on YouTube, and and don't forget, folks, you can find us on YouTube. Uh, it shows up as a video, just push play, and you can hear our podcast right there on YouTube, yeah, on our YouTube channel. A lot of people will catch us on Facebook, and, yeah. they, and they go straight to our YouTube. Yeah, and his comment that he left was, congrats, guys. Keep them coming. Uh, excellent. I mean, that's what we love to hear. I mean, it is. Now, can I bring up the good news? A friend of mine, and I use his gamer tag, 
uh, of Harkonnen. He knows who we're talking oh, about. Yeah, and I'm does. sure a lot of you know who Harkonnen is. He is the founder, editor for a web page that covers a lot of military games and also a lot of military history. And it's an amazing site. If you haven't went and seen it, it's called The Daily Bounce, correct? That's correct. The Daily Bounce. And he uh, was very, very cool. And he posted uh, our show on his thing. And he goes, I wonder if that helps you in any way. And I'm like, would you believe our show shot up 93%? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, the, the two different times that he's actually featured us on The Daily Bounce, the website. It's it's pretty much doubled our downloads. It's amazing. It's incredible what that's done, and we really do appreciate that. So we're going to try to help him out. So if you can go over there to the Daily Bounce and uh, yeah, uh, throw him some likes or, or throw him some money. We oh yeah, we, we, I believe you can. He you appreci- can contribute to him through Patreon. Yeah, just like he can. Yeah, he us. can. So, yeah. so yeah, definitely help him out. Throw yeah. the, throw him some money. He enjoys money. Yeah. I- <laughs> But he lives in, uh, uh, I believe, uh, Europe. Cool. Very, very cool guy. You want to get on the show? Hey, we might as well. Okay. Get ready, folks, because this is the first amphibious. No, we've done an amphibious we type. We have. Yeah. The PT-76? That was our Vietnam episode, I believe. We oh, talked about the... When the... Not the M60. Oh. The Patton was in Vietnam and it got in a tank battle. Yeah. And it was an amphibious. The, yeah. Amphibious tanks. Okay. Well, this is probably one of the first ones. Um, the Soviets back in the day really wanted a amphibious tank and they started designing them. Like we always say, research this history on yourself. Please do. Uh, because there is so much. Go to tankexcitecopedia.com and, and look at these tanks. We're just talking about just one mod that they mm, came up yeah, with. Yeah. And, uh, it, it just research it. It is just read about it. It's so amazing. And all the research is actually done for you. Yeah. I, you know, let's face it. Most of this time, it's the stuff I'm just like, I'm going to write it's this incredible. down. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, uh, this T 38 amphibious scout tank, um, the, the T 34, the T-38 and Fabio, we're going to try it again. The T-38 amphibious scout tank was a Soviet amphibious light tank that saw service in World War II. It actually saw it in the Winter War II. It, eh, it was ready for, you know, battle then. Didn't do really good up there. Um, it was developed as a uh, modernized version of the earlier T-37A light tank. The T-38 proved... Uh, to be only a moderate improvement over its predecessor and was eventually replaced in 1940 by the T-40. Ah, the T-40. Uh, Russ, tell us a little bit. Uh, yeah, everybody likes the <laughs> T-40. The T-40 is a fun tank. We're going to have to yeah. do that one too. But uh, tell us a little bit of, about the history of the T-38. Yeah, early trials of the T-37A revealed many deficiency in its design, including limited range, subpar buoyancy, and an unreliable transmission and running gear that could cause its tracks to fall off while on the move. Could you imagine that? (laughs) (laughs) You know what? Uh, When you're like the test driver and you're driving around and and you've got all these big Soviet generals or or Stalin watching you, Uh, and all of a sudden the (laughs) tracks, you might be in trouble. Development of an improved version of the tank that would fix these flaws was begun in late 1934 at factory number 37 in Moscow. And that was under the direction of chief designer in Astrov and chief engineer in Kozarov. The redesign proved to be so extensive that the project was given the independent designation T-38. And a prototype was completed by June of 1935. So, so they pretty much just redeveloped it from the start. and Yeah. Well, tell us some about uh, the improvements the T-38 had. Uh, the T-38 retained many design features of the T-37A, including its repurposed GAZ-AA engine and hand-operated turret. The turret was moved from the right to the left-hand side of the tank, 
and it's switching the driver and the commander positions compared to the T-37A. The T-38 also had a slightly wider and lower profile than its predecessor, providing an advantage in buoyancy that made the cork buoys used on the T-37A unnecessary. So the T-37, they put cork in. They like, floated the thing with corks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, I know you guys are thinking oh, that we're crazy, but I'm God. telling you, these Soviet designers said, mm, we're going to make this tank float, so yeah. we're going to put cork in it. Worth a try. <laughs> well, it works for fishing, I guess. <laughs> While the production model T-38 was only armed with a 7.62 millimeter DT machine gun, the initial prototype vehicle also included a 20 millimeter cannon mounted on the driver's position. This was removed after it was determined the additional cannon Impaired the driver's ability to control the tank. So it did have a 20 millimeter yeah, cannon. Yeah. But all of a sudden the driver's like, you know, bend to the left and going, uh, uh, and then it would fire. Kind of hampering his driving capabilities <laughs> a little there. Yeah. If you got a 20 millimeter cannon right by your head, eh, maybe a bad idea. <laughs> like other light tanks of its time, the T-38 was designed for reconnaissance and infantry support roles. As a scout tank, the T-38 had the advantages of a very low silhouette and good long-range mobility through its ability to swim. Nice. The T-38 was also intended to be air portable. During the Kiev maneuvers in 1936, the tanks were transported by Tupolev TB-3 bombers mounted under the fuselage. So these tanks were light enough I got to see if I can find some pictures of that just to. Oh, uh, oh we'll put them wow. on our Facebook and, and we'll try to do that. But he, can you imagine that there's this tank stuck underneath the airplane <laughs> and they're flying it out. And as soon as they la- land it, the crew gets out of the airplane, jumps on the tank and then, wow. and then goes through the river. Wow. Well, believe it or not, we're going to talk about that, uh, uh, river raid, um, and uh, the assault, they use these things. So go ahead. I'm sorry. I cut in. Infantry battalions were each issued 38 T-38s, with 50 being designated for each airborne armored battalion. So when they landed these airplanes, they needed some type of armor, you know, to support the troops that are getting dumped out yeah. and, and set up a perimeter. Sure. So it's actually a really good idea. These planes land... Th- they get in the, these tanks, go straight into battle, set up a safe green zone, if you would, for the airplanes. Uh, great idea. However, the thin armor and single machine gun armament made the tank of only limited use in combat, and the lack of a radio in most T-38s was a serious limitation for a reconnaissance vehicle. Again, the Soviets weren't putting radios in in their tanks. Um, I think the early T-34s and stuff like that didn't have it, yeah. have that either. And that is just crazy being a scout tank, being out there, you know, in front of the front lines, pretty much seeing what was going on and how are they getting that information back to the front lines? And they, they literally have to turn around, yeah. race back. Yeah. And, and if you're being chased or, or the enemy's on the move, you might have just a couple of minutes. Sure. The T-38 also struggled with carrying any excess cargo across water. The tank was incapable of supporting the weight of two infantrymen while floating, and overloads of 120 to 150 kilos would cause the commander's hatch to flood, and that would actually sink the vehicle. Good Lord. So they're I guess like, the corks didn't work as good as they thought they would. Well, the T-38 took them out. Oh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. maybe they should have left yeah, them maybe in. Maybe they should have. But, you know, they're going across the river and a couple of these guys are like, I really don't want to swim this r- river with this machine gun strapped to my back. I, I, think, I think I'll swim it on my own. You take it across. But, uh, <laughs> you know, maybe, you know, one guy could stand on top of it with, you know, carrying yeah. a machine gun and jump off. So... I guess if you're taking somebody, one's better than none. What's the famous saying? It is what it is? It is what it is. These flaws were to be fixed by the T-38's successor, the T-40, but only a small number were built before the outbreak of World War II, leaving the T-37A and T-38 to form the bulk of the Red Army's amphibious tanks. So they wanted to get the T-40, but the big war started, and they started shoving everything they could into building KVs yeah, and T-34s. Yeah. 
A total of 1,228 T-38 tanks were built from 1936 to 1937, with an additional 112 made in 1939 after a two-year break in production. They were going through some purges and stuff like that and reorganization of the Soviet. But uh, what were what were some of the variants of the tank? I know we they had like a flamethrower and they had like a uh, self-propelled gun. Uh, like a tank destroyer. Uh, Tell us a a little about about the variants. The T-38RT, which was built in 1937, it was a version that was equipped with radio and turret-mounted 20-millimeter cannon. That's the one they should have made. Exactly. They also had the OT-38, built in 1937. It was actually the flamethrower-equipped version of the tank. (laughs) Oh, now see... You throw on some gas and then drive with uh, flamethrower tanks. You know, we've talked about the Stewart's yeah. uh, Satan tank and stuff like that. Be Church. interesting to see how they had the setup on this particular tank, whether they had the trailer behind or to carry the fuel or where they carried the fuel. Uh, they, I bet they couldn't carry much of the oh, flamethrower I, fluid. Probably not. About one guy's weight worth. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Don't try to cross the river with your fuel. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> Might go down to the bottom. They also had the T-38TU variant. It was a command version with an extra radio antenna on it. They also had the SU-45 variant. It was built in 1936, and it was a 45 millimeter self-propelled gun. So basically it's like a tank destroyer. Tank destroyer. Sure. They, they put a 45 millimeter gun on it and kind of boxed it up a little bit. I probably would have rocked that little tank oh, quite yeah. a bit. <laughs> yeah. That's when you put the tank in neutral and fire and it <laughs> rolls back about 10 foot. And they also had the T-38TT variant built in 1939. It was an experimental remotely controlled tank. We were talking about drones uh, a couple of episodes ago. And, and here's like one of the very first teletanks. In 1939. And in 1939, they started, they understood that that was going to be a thing that you get a tank that's remote controlled. You can send it into the worst combat zones, handle business from there. But you know, and it's finally coming to fruition today. Yeah. With all these drones and stuff that we're getting. That's amazing. It is. Okay. Russ, my favorite part. Tell us the stats on the tank. Yeah. Some of the stats on the T-38, the designer, like we talked about earlier, that was Nikolai Astroff and Kozarev. It was built in factory number 37 in Moscow, mm-hmm. designed between 1934 and 1936, and it was made, like we said, in factory number 37. Uh, it was actually produced between 1937 and 1939, and they built a total of 1,340. Wow. Well, okay. Uh, tell us about the sizes and stuff. Yeah. Uh, the actual mass of the tank, about 3.3 tons, had a length of 3.78 meters a width of 3.33 meters, and a height of 1.63 meters. Yeah, so they made it wider yeah. so it would float better. Would float. Or that buoyancy we were sure. talking about. How many How many crew? It had a crew of two, and its armor was anywhere between three and nine millimeters thick. <laughs> that's, that's not very that, thick. That's not very thick. No. Uh, there's some heavy machine guns that would go through that like butter. But, you know, if you're just getting shot at with small arms, I'd yeah. still... I'd still take that back. Sure. Besides nothing. I mean, you're out, in, like we said, in the front of the front lines, you, scouting to see what's going on. And you got snipers yeah, and everything yeah. else. So, okay. So, you're probably not going to have a lot of big guns ready to... Ready to rock yeah. and roll. Its main armament was a 7.62 millimeter DT machine gun. Its engine was the gaz A four-cylinder inline gasoline engine. Cranked out about 40 horsepower or 30 kilowatts of power. 40, 40 horsepower. Oh, wow. Can you imagine Some that? Some lawnmowers today, I think, have probably twice that, don't oh, they? Yeah, absolutely. It had a power to weight ratio of about 12 horsepower per ton. So it's a three ton tank. So it's getting 12. Wow. Okay. My my push lawnmower has a 12 horsepower oh, engine on it, people. Um, what kind of suspension? It had a sprung bogey suspension, and it had an operational range of about 170 kilometers. Okay, so that's not bad. And it had a top speed of about 40 kilometers per hour, and that was probably on straight, solid ground. Okay, so basically you got 
a mobile machine gun carrier unless it was you know had the flamethrower unit or it had the 20 millimeter cannon but for a, a scout tank it, as long as it had the radio you know the like they talked about the command tank yeah. had an extra antenna and stuff that wouldn't be bad yeah you're, you're buzzing around the field doing 40 kilometers an hour you got 170 mile or kilometer uh, kilometers range I, and like we talked about at the beginning it was mainly designed for its amphibious feature. Right. So we, That's what they were looking for. And, and sneaking across a river, because all the bridges were, you know, just blocked and mined sure. and had all their troops there. These things would just whoop, go right on behind, right get on, behind the lines. Right on the cross. Wow. Well, tell us a little bit about the service history, Russ. Yeah, the tank served with the Red Army in the Winter War of Finland in 1940 but was unsuccessful due to its light armament and thin armor, which was easily penetrated by rifle and light machine gun fire. Ooh. Not good. So their heavy caliber rifles were just, yeah, okay. So In the confined terrain of Finland, the tank was a death trap. It also did not do well in the early stages of World War II, and large numbers were captured by the Germans during Operation Barbarossa. Now, the Germans caught these, but here's the deal. You know, the Germans... Usually, whatever they captured, they used. Yeah. Uh, they used the French tanks, uh, like we have that German uh, heavy tank in World of Tanks, the B2 or B1 or whatever it is. But they were grabbing even Shermans and T-34s and KVs, and they even captured a KV-2, which we're going to have to do an episode. Oh, yeah. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, Rick... Uh, said, oh, you got to do an episode on the KV-2. Oh, the KV-2, But yes. they'd capture them, and they'd use them. And they got these little bitty tanks, and they're like, no. Probably not going to no. work out too great. So they didn't use any of these. You know, they looked at them, played with them, probably sank a few, but. <laughs> the T-38 was rarely seen in direct combat after 1941, and mostly relegated to other roles, such as artillery tractor, although it was used in the, the Niper River crossing of 1943. So basically, they were like, okay, we have these artillery pieces, and we don't have the trucks, and, or in our trucks that we do have are loaded with ammunition, troops, and stuff like that. So we're going to go ahead and use these to pull artillery into places. Yeah. Might as well use it. They got them. Well, got them there. You know, and th- that it was used in this uh, Dnieper River crossing in 1943. Uh, that brings us to our second point. Uh, Russ, tell us about that. Yeah, the Battle of the Dnieper was a military campaign that took place in 1943 on the eastern front of World War II. It was one of the largest operations in World War II, involving almost 4 million troops at a time, stretched on a 1,400-kilometer or about a 870-mile-long front. Holy smokes. That, Pretty good size, that's yeah. A lo- that's a lot. That's a lot. Four million guys, but they're spread over 870 miles. That's that's Or, or I'm crazy. sorry, yeah. 1,400 kilometers. Yeah. The first bridgehead on the Dnieper's western shore was established on September 22nd of 1943. So they, the Soviet forces had been pushed to the east side of the river, and the Germans were in control of all the bridges and low crossing areas and stuff like that. And they needed to find a place to break from the east side of the river to the west side. And they didn't establish their first, you know, west bridgehead until September 22nd of 1943. Wow. The crossing of the Dnieper was extremely difficult. Soldiers used every available floating device to cross the river under heavy German fire, and they took pretty heavy losses. Once across, Soviet troops had to dig themselves into the clay ravines composing the Dnieper's western bank. Wow. So they're talking about anything that floats. They're talking about old boats, canoes, these T-38s that can only literally hold one person to one get across. Person, yeah. And once the armor's over there, these poor little thing, tanks are, have to get up there and push back the snipers and stuff, so the boats and everything can come across. And there comes in probably the flamethrower versions of the... Wow. To get uh, in and take out some of the pillboxes that probably... Now, see, I have studied the units and the commanders of uh, the engagements uh, on that eastern-western front, and uh, the general, 
uh, are on the the side that we're talking about. The first uh, beachhead um, was run by a guy named Hans Kalner, and he was in charge of the 19th Panth, uh, Panzer Division. Now that was a Wehrmacht division; it wasn't an SS division, but it it can uh, it had the 27th Panzer Regiment, it had the 73rd pa- uh, Panzer Grenadier, the 74th Panzer Gr- Grenadier regiments. Um, they had the 19th Panzer Artillery Regiment, um, the 19th Motorcycle Battalion. They also used that as like a scout battalion. Um, the 19th Tank uh, Destroyer Battalion, the 19th uh, Panzer Engineer Battalion, and the 19th Panzer Signal Battalion. But they also had the 272nd uh, Any uh, Aircraft Battalion. Cool. So it sounds like this uh, General Hans had his stuff together. But remember, he had just the 19th uh, Division had just took major damage in Stalingrad and getting pushed back by their uh, friends. So it was basically kind of a shattered division. The only thing they really had was the 19th Motorcycle Battalion, and the rest of these, they it was just skeleton crews. Wow. So when we talk about uh, this, you know, pa- you know, Panzer Division Wehrmark sitting there waiting for the, these guys, they were the, really the only thing that was standing against them. But they had noticed from some of their scouts on these motorcycles that the Soviets were gathering all these wood rafts and, you know, these, you know, bringing in logs to start building a bridge and they were bringing in these little armored T 38s and they're like, uh, they're going to make a crossing here. So they sent all the, this whole guy out there. What they didn't know is they were uh, getting ready to face a pretty smart cookie for the Soviets. The Soviets' third guard uh, tank army, basically the opposing force of uh, the 19th Panzer Division, was the Soviet third guard's tank army. And it was run by Colonel General Pavel uh, Rebenkel. I always, I kill their names. Rebenkel? Rebenkel. But uh, he had all his stuff. Yeah, you know, and he was getting the airplanes come in, and like we were talking, the bombers were landing and bringing these little T-38s, and he's using everything he's got. So, uh, Russ, go ahead and tell us a little bit about this. The German troops soon launched heavy counterattacks on almost every bridgehead, hoping to annihilate them before heavy equipment could be transported across the river. Soviet air support set up air patrols to prevent bombers from approaching the lodgements and ordered forward more artillery to counter tank attacks from the opposite shore. Hundreds of guns and Katusha rocket launchers began firing and the situation started to improve and the bridgehead was eventually preserved. So you've got to imagine the 19th Panzer. These motorcycle patrols see that they're starting to cross these T-38s. And they're like, hey, they're crossing here. They're making a bridgehead. They've already started digging in the clay. We need bombers and everything like that. So they start really hitting these guys as hard as they could, trying to push them back into the water. So they're attacking with bombers, and, and they're attacking with you know whatever tanks they got left, whatever artillery. So the Soviet <laughs> general or colonel, and if you research this Soviet colonel, he actually has a military school Named after him. Named after him. It, wow. It's in uh, Russia, or in the former Soviet Union, and he 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 goes on goes clear to Berlin and stuff, and he's really really tactically sound with what he had to work with armor wise. But he wants to bring across his T thirty fours, his KV, so he sends everything over there. They start hitting him, and he's like, "Okay, I want fighters to start knocking these bombers out of the air." So they. Soviets send tons of airplanes over there and start knocking these bombers out. And the German bombers like, hey, you're not getting any more bomber support. And then they bring up these hundreds of artillery that'll go over. But have you ever seen a Katusha rocket fire? One of the Katusha ro- rocket trucks? I, no, I haven't. Uh, people, if you haven't seen it, there's tons of video on YouTube. I'll have to look that uh, up on YouTube. Yeah, They fired tons of it. And all it is is an unguided rocket. With a big old... Is it one of the multiple yeah, rocket launchers? Yeah. Okay. I mean, it, it makes such a crazy noise. 
I think they call it like a Stalingrad organ or uh, Stalin's organ. And, and it would do, wow. fire all these rockets. Incredible. And would cover this whole area. These Germans were wiped out, basically, and they had to back up. Man. But the initial, these tanks and these guys on boats and canoes, can you imagine crossing that river? Oh, you're just a in sitting se- duck. In, in September? Yeah. And you're still in the Soviet sure. Union. Sure. You're freezing, and, and you're going across there. The water's cold. Some of these guys swam across there just to get over there to fight. Today's millennials, hey, I couldn't do it. No, better men than I am. Yep, better men than I I am. Um, what well, brings us to our closing? I hope you guys enjoyed the episode. But we got some uh, Patreon sh- shout outs to do. Yeah, we want to continue our Patreon shout outs. Shout out to Andy Crow. He's still with us. Born Ben. Uh, Christy uh, McCarty. And Kevin Shin, which are big supporters of my live stream. And we still got Kyler Montgomery and Mark Drake and ODS Thero still with us. And my buddy Rick Schmidt. And Rick Schmidt. He's been on me to do the KV2 episode. And I'm like, you know what? Episode 30, we're going to be doing that. Yeah. Um, to give you guys a heads up, uh, our Patreon, we are going to be releasing some uh, new exclusive content. And the content we're going to uh, talk about is the some of the movies that are tank movies that a lot of people don't know about. I mean, everybody always says, oh, well, there's, you know, the Fury and there's like Sahara and Kelly's Heroes and stuff like this. These are movies that I have in my personal collection that are very, very old. And some of them are from the former uh, Soviet Union, uh, you know, states and stuff like that. Yeah, I'm excited to hear yeah. Hear about some of these, and I'll probably start adding to my collection eventually. Yeah. Hey, and if you want to listen to our uh, exclusive content, you need to join our Patreon. Yeah. We do put stuff out. A um, couple of bucks will get you access. Yep. And like I said, uh, before we start sending out our some of our gear or merchandise, that's going to be open up to our Patreon guys. So if you're sitting on the fence or you don't think you, we need help, we're looking at spending what another five hundred dollars on equipment to do yeah. interviews. Yeah. Um, who's the guy up in Nebraska that we? Andrew Hill. Andrew Hill. We want to go up there and see him and see his stuff, yeah. and we want to do an interview. Um, uh, Nicholas Moran from the Chieftain, you know the Chieftain. Yes. yes. Uh, he just came out with a new book. I can't remember the name of the book, but we. I want to do an interview with him. Yes. Yeah. And uh, there's other streamers yeah. like uh, Sophie. Uh, Ed, I want to do an e- interview with Ed. He, Ed is the guy who does all the wargaming British tanks. Oh, wow. Uh, in fact, uh, talking of uh, World of Tanks, uh, you remember Cowboy MT? You know, oh, yeah. Cowboy yeah. up in Montana we yeah. went and had hamburgers with. Oh, yeah. Um, the other day I'm streaming, and I'm talking about this new premium tank that World of Tanks put out, the Turtle. He bought it. He oh, bought it and gifted it to wow. me. Wow. And I'm like, nice. Cowboy, thank you so much. Yes, you yes. Know, what, what a cool. Kurt is just an amazing guy. They got some pretty good folks up there in Montana. They're, Montana is just, if you guys have never been. Incredible state. Uh, there's no tanks. We, we look for them, but there's no tanks. Definitely big sky country. But big sky country. We did not understand what big sky meant. And when you get there, you understand what big sky is. Exactly. I, I, I really don't know how to describe it. It was the first time in my life, even Russ, we had to stop the car and step out. And we're like, oh, my God, this is what Big Sky means. Yeah, it is. And we all, all the states. Everybody, I, I mean, I challenge everybody out there listening to experience that someday. It I is. I mean, just, it's, it's, it's neat. And remember, if you're near the Kansas City area, give us a holler. Well, we'll come up there and uh, do a show or, yes. you, know, you know, come up there and have lunch with you. But like Charlie talked about a while ago, with the equipment that we're wanting to purchase and what we really want to do eventually is bring some interviews to you folks from the road. But I want to do it right. I want to get the right equipment to do it with. Absolutely. And I don't just want to, you know, use my have cell to phone. It. <laughs> use, <laughs> use my cell phone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but there is the equipment out there, and the show is growing so much. It is much. incredible. And uh, once again, thank you, Daily Bounce. You're helping a lot. Oh, absolutely. For growing the show even more. Harkonnen's the boy now. He's yeah, a good guy. Man. But everybody, I shouldn't. we just shouldn't 
name one person. You no, know, like we no. said, we appreciate everybody. It wasn't for all of our listeners. And we're our- closing in on almost 8,000 downloads off of Podbean in one year's time. And, and that's not including uh, iTunes and everything else. Yeah. And we would not be this successful if it wasn't for our listeners. Yep. And, and followers and, and, and Patreon. people commenting on all this. Yep. Thanks for showing interest. Absolutely. Well, uh, this is the end of the show. Uh, we'll do KV2 for episode 30. Yep, so I believe that's on the agenda. Yeah, excellent. And we're going to do exclusive Patreon you know, info. Yep. Well, this is Charlie signing off. And this is Russell. As always, happy tanking and have a great week. <laughs>